So apart from that, let's go to the next one, which is asking stage two roles of active transport. So the first role of active transport, we see that it mainly helps in the small intestine whereby we have the absorption of food or the absorption of mineral salts from the large intestine. So we have that absorption which mainly takes place in the intestines whereby some materials will be absorbed by active transport, some materials will be absorbed by diffusion. So apart from that, we have absorption of mineral salts from the root, uh, not from the root, so the absorption of mineral salts from the soil and into the root hair cell. So those are among the roles of active transport. So the active transport, remember, it, it comes about from a physiological processes that we have and let's define what is cell physiology. So cell physiology, this is the study of the cell function. So this is the study of cell function. So cell physiology is also an other branch of biology whereby we have physiology. Physiology means the study of the body function. So that's the branch, which is physiology, study of the body function. In this case, we have been asked about cell physiology. So cell physiology, this is the study of the cell functions. That's the definition of cell physiology, whereby we see that we have three main physiological processes. The first one is diffusion, the second one is osmosis, the third one is active transport. What's the definition of diffusion? So diffusion is the process whereby uh, molecules or particles will move from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. That's the definition of diffusion. So what's the definition of osmosis? Osmosis will define it as this is the process whereby water molecules move from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. And note this, if you have been given any living tissue as an experiment in an exam, any living tissue is going to point towards osmosis because that living tissue, that is a semi-permeable membrane. So any living tissue, it points towards that experiment you are being asked is osmosis and not diffusion or active transport. So for examples of the living tissue that you might be given, you might be given banana peel, you might be given a potato, you might be given um, any, an orange peel. So not this, unless the question states otherwise. But if you have been given any living tissue, note that, that is osmosis which is being tested. So apart from that, the third physiological process, we have active transport. So whereby for the active transport, you'll define as this is the movement of molecules across or against. This is the movement of molecules against the concentration gradient. So for example, for us to understand active transport better, you'll see that if for diffusion, the molecules should move from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. That is diffusion. But now the active transport will Tell these molecules, no, you molecules, you must move from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration. So the active transport always acts against concentration gradient. So if the concentration gradient wants molecules to move that other side, so active transport will move those molecules from that side, which is not wanted to the opposite side. So that is active transport. So those are the three main physiological processes that we have, diffusion active transport, and osmosis. So the next question is asking is that diagram that you can see. A student was trying to estimate the size of an onion cell. He counted 20 cells across the field of view. So he counted 20 cells. So that is the field of view. So the field of view is the region in the microscope whereby you can be able to observe the cell. So that region of the microscope you can be able to observe the cell, that spherical region, that is the one which is called the field of view. So the student was trying to estimate the size of an onion cells and then he counted 20 cells. So the first question is asking, what are the units used to measure the size of the cell? Or what are the units used to calculate the size of the cell? So the units to use are always micrometer. So micrometer, these are always the units for calculating the size of a cell. So the next question B is asking, find the size of one cell or calculate the size of one cell. So the field of view is always, uh, the units for the field of view is always in millimeters. So for us to calculate the size of one cell, so we are going to convert these millimeters to micrometer. And then, so you are going to use the formula by one millimeter is equals to a thousand micrometer. So you must first of all understand this conversion in order for you to continue. So one millimeter is equals to a thousand micrometer. So as you can see, 
the diameter of field of view, if you put the ruler there, it was coming at 4 cm. So the diameter of field of view was 4 cm. Therefore, remember, so you must convert these centimeters to micrometer, which are the appropriate units for calculating the size of the, of the cell. So first of all, let's convert these centimeters to millimeters. So what do we do? So we'll use the conversion whereby we know that one centimeter is equals to 10 millimeters. So having one centimeter is equals to 10 millimeters. So how about four centimeters? So four centimeter, it will mean that the four centimeter, it will be equal to 40 millimeters. So that centimeter is equals to 40 millimeters. Therefore, uh, we know that one millimeter is equals to a thousand micrometer. So let's convert now these 40 millimeters to, uh, to micrometer. So the conversion which we are going to do, we are going to say 40 millimeters, or rather we're going to say one millimeter is equals to a thousand micrometer. So how about 40 millimeters? So 40 millimeters, we are going to get 40,000 micrometer. So in this 40,000 micrometer, if you divide 40,000 divided by 20, so we're going to get that it is approximately 1,950 micrometer. But that's the size of one cell. So the first thing that you should do in this, uh, in this conversion, first of all, you must calculate the, or you must find, just use a ruler, find the size of the diameter of field of view. So the size or the length of diameter of field of view got it as 4 centimeters. So after doing this, 4 centimeters, so convert these centimeters to micrometer. If you convert the centimeters to micrometer, that 4 centimeters to micrometer, so you are going to get that we have, uh, we have, 40,000 micrometers. So that is the unit for calculating the size of the cell. So we have 40,000 micrometer. That is the diameter of field of view in this case. It was 4 centimeter. 4 centimeter to micrometer is 40,000 micrometer. Therefore, we have been asked, uh, uh, like we have been told that we have 20 cells. So for you to calculate the size of one cell, you will just divide the diameter of field of view divided by the number of cells. So if you do this, you're going to get the size of only one cell. And the size of only one cell, if you do that, and that's what we get approximately 1,950 micrometer as the estimation for one cell. So let's go to the next number. And it's asking, what is meant by the term resolving power of the microscope? So resolving power of the microscope, this is the ability of the microscope to be able to distinguish or differentiate between two or more parts of the cell. So that is the resolving part, the ability of the microscope to be able to distinguish between two or more parts of the cell. So whereby for electron microscope, since it has very high magnification, the resolving power is very high. For the light microscope, since it has very low magnification compared to electron microscope, therefore the light microscope will have very low resolving power. And that was the definition. So resolving power, remember, this is the ability of the microscope to be able to distinguish between two or more parts of the organism or of the cell. So the next question is asking, what is the name given to the process below? So this process that you can see, what is the name given to this process? So for this process, you see that blood, blood from this side is going to that side. And then at the same time, the water from that side is coming to this side. So it's like they are exchanging. So that's the process. And this process only takes place in one organism. No other organism has this type of, uh, has this type of exchange. So it only takes place in one organism. So the question is asking, what is the name given to this process below? So this is the counter current flow of water, which mainly takes place in the fish during gaseous exchange. And the specific place it takes place in the gill filament of the fish. So this process, remember, is the counter current flow of water which takes place in the gill filament of the fish. So remember, the respiratory surfaces that we have, remember for the fish we have the gills, for the insect tracheal system, for the human beings we have the alveoli, for the frogs we have the, we have the skin, the buccal cavity. So this process mainly takes place in the fish, in the gill filament of the fish. And the name given to this process is counter current flow of water. So. Like any time you see that you have blood going to that side and the water is coming this side, so it's like they are brushing. So always know that that process is counter current flow of water. So the next question is asking, state an advantage of this process. So the advantage of this process is that it enables the fish to carry out gaseous exchange. 
that is the only function of this process no other function it enables the fish to be able to carry out the process of gaseous exchange and you are good to go so the next question is asking state the function of each of the following ribosome what's the function of the ribosome because we see that ribosome is one of the organelles which are found inside the cell so what's the function of the ribosome so the function of ribosome is that ribosome assists in protein synthesis so protein synthesis means making so anytime in biology you'll see the name synthesis synthesis means to make so that's the function of protein of the ribosome which is protein synthesis or the function is to make protein so you should always remember that ribosomes are found on the rough endoplasmic reticulum so after the ribosomes have made the protein the protein enters into the rough endoplasmic reticulum and then the function of the rough endoplasmic reticulum is now to transport this protein so the function of the rough endoplasmic reticulum if you have been asked know that the function is to transport protein so that's the function of the ribosome so the other function is mitochondrion what's the function of the mitochondrion so these produce energy for the cell and it's as simple as that so the mitochondrion is used to produce energy for the cell if you can see this the diagram of the mitochondrion whereby we have the outer membrane we have the inner membrane then we have the cristae and then the matrix so the cristae are greatly folded in order to increase the surface area over which uh, respiration process is going to take place so that's why the cristae are gre greatly folded in order to increase the surface area over which the process of respiration is going to take place so the, the other one you have been asked about the centrioles. So the function of centrioles is that the centrioles are used in cell division whereby this majorly takes place in the metaphase stage of cell division. And in the metaphase stage of cell division, remember, we have the centrioles that are aligned on the opposite poles. So the function of the centrioles is that they stretch the spindle fibers and the spindle fibers attach themselves to the to the chromosomes and then they split the chromosome so that's the first function of the centrioles they are used in cell division whereby the main place they they serve is the metaphase and also the anaphase as they pull towards the poles so the other function of the centriole is that they assist in the formation of cilia and flagellum which are used for uh, for the microscopic organisms to move like for example you can see that is the flagellum which which is found in the sperm. So in the sperm, that tail which helps to propel the sperm, that is the flagellum. And also those are the cilia which are very tiny hair-like projections on the organisms which enable the organism to be able to move. So the first function of the centriole, remember the formation of cilia and flagellum. The second function of the centrioles, remember, they assist in cell division. So the next question is asking, the diagram below shows the part of the circulatory system. The arrows show the direction of blood flow, as you can see. So the arrow is showing the direction of the blood flow. So since we have been told about the blood flow, so what hits our mind is that this question might be asking about the circulatory system because we have been told that the blood is flowing on this direction. So the question is mostly asking, mostly asking about the circulatory system. So, question letter A is asking, name the blood vessel A and B. So, the blood vessel A, we see that in this diagram, we have the ileum. So, from the ileum, we are going to that organ, which has not been named. So, from the ileum, we are going to that organ, whereby we have the B and the D living. So, name the blood vessel A and B. So, since the blood is coming from the small intestine, we know that blood from the small intestine always enters the liver. That is exactly what happens. So from the intestine, blood doesn't go straight to the vena cava. From the intestine, blood first of all enters the liver. Now from the liver is now whereby the blood now will go to the vena cava. Therefore, already if we have that information whereby blood first of all from the intestine must enter into the liver. Therefore, this blood vessel A automatically becomes mesenetric, mesenetric vein because it is only from through the mesenetic vein whereby the blood leaves the intestine and into the liver. So that blood vessel is called mesenetic vein. So the second question is asking, name the blood vessel, uh, name the blood vessel B. So the blood vessel B, since we already know that the organ is liver, therefore the blood vessel B must be oxygenated blood and the only blood vessel is hepatic 
artery. So it is hepatic artery that supplies the liver with oxygenated blood. And then the hepatic vein removes deoxygenated blood from the liver. Therefore, it will mean that blood vessel B is hepatic artery because it is only hepatic artery that supplies the liver with oxygenated blood. It is only hepatic vein that removes deoxygenated blood from the liver. So the reason why we say that this organ is the liver is that the intestines are the ones that give us the hint. So blood from the intestine enters the liver. It is only the liver from the intestine. So blood from this intestine only enters the liver through the mesenetric vein. So since we know that the organ is the liver, therefore blood vessel B automatically becomes hepatic artery. Blood vessel D automatically becomes hepatic vein. Because it is only hepatic, uh, the hepatic blood vessels that supply the liver with oxygenated and, deoxy and removes deoxygenated blood. So the next question is asking, state one function of the ileum in digestion. So the ileum is the second part of the small intestine. So the first part of the small intestine from the stomach. So from the stomach, we go to the first part of the small intestine, which is referred to as the duodenum. So in the duodenum, this is the first part of the small intestine. The second part of the small intestine is now which is called the ileum. So uh, like in the duodenum, we see that the food or the chyme is rich in hydrochloric acid. Since it is rich in hydrochloric acid, we have the bile juice which has sodium hydrogen carbonate. Now this sodium hydrogen carbonate from the bile juice neutralizes the acidic chyme. So it neutralizes the acidic chyme producing sodium chloride water and carbon dioxide. So after eating too much, this is where now the carbon dioxide comes from, from this neutralization reaction. Now the food now, that is now neutral, will enter the small intestine after several functions have taken place whereby we have the pancreas releasing the pancreatic amylase. The pancreatic amylase will be able to digest starch to carbohydrate, will have the lipase which will be able now to convert the fat into glycogen or oils, etc. Now, in the small intestine, now food from the duodenum enters now the small intestine, the small, the ileum rather, enters the ileum, which is the second part of the small intestine. Now, in the small intestine, we see that absorption of food takes place through the millions of villi found on the walls of the small intestine. So we have the absorption of food materials and then in the small intestine is also where digestion is completed. So the digestion of the food is also completed in the small intestine. And those are the two main functions of the small intestine that takes, takes place. So there's the completion of digestion and then there's also uh, also, there's the neutralization of the acidic of the acidic chyme, and also there's the absorption of food. So those are the main things or the main processes that takes place in the small intestine. So the next question is asking, it's about photosynthesis, and it's asking, explain the products of light stage in photosynthesis. So explain the products. This question is specific. This question is asking about the products of light stage. You have not been asked explain the process of light stage that is not the question the question is asking explain the products of light stage so you must only explain the products of the light stage only so explain the products of the light stage in photosynthesis so let's define photosynthesis what is photosynthesis so this is the process whereby uh, green plants make their own food by using the requirements like sunlight, water, moisture, etc. So this is the process whereby green plants make their own food. So if you have been asked in an exam, define photosynthesis, never say this. Never say that photosynthesis is a process whereby plants make their own food. If you say that, you are going to get it wrong. Because you see that there are some plants which do not make their own food. There are plants which make their own food. These are the green plants. So for photosynthesis definition, you must always say that this is the process whereby green plants make their own food and then list the requirements using water, using uh, moisture, that is water, using sunlight, using chlorophyll, etc. So don't just say it's the process whereby plants. You must say the process whereby green plants make their own food. So for, for photosynthesis, we see that we have two stages whereby the first stage, we have the light stage, uh, whereby light stage mainly takes place when there is light. Dark stage mainly takes place when there is no light. 
So mostly avoid saying that life stage takes place during the day. Avoid saying that. Because during the day, we may take that plant at, and put it inside a very dark cupboard. If you take that plant and put it inside a very dark cupboard, that plant will undergo the dark stage. For example, at night, if you take that plant and place it where there is bright light having UV, that plant is going to undertake the light stage of photosynthesis, even though at, uh, like in the surrounding, it's, it's at night. So that's how plants in the greenhouse, they can be able to grow very fast. It's because during the night, during the day, they still have the light. So they are always going to photosynthesize and they are going to grow very fast. So for the definition of light stage, dark stage, avoid saying that light stage takes place during the day, dark stage takes place during the night. Avoid saying that. Say that light stage takes place when there is light, dark stage takes place when there is no light. So that's the appropriate definition for the light stage and the dark stage. So for the light stage, we see that uh, the water molecules are split inside the grana, whereby we have the chlorophyll. So the water molecules are split inside the, the grana by the use of, of chlorophyll into hydrogen atoms, not ions, into hydrogen atoms and oxygen molecule. Now, uh, uh, like as per this question, this is what the question is asking. Now these products, hydrogen atoms and oxygen molecules. So the question is asking, explain the products of light stage in photosynthesis. Those are the products that we are only going to talk about. Hydrogen atoms, oxygen, gas, and ATP energy. So those three things are the ones that you are going to focus on. So in the light stage, remember, water molecule is broken down by the use of chlorophyll to hydrogen atoms, oxygen, gas, or molecules, and then plus ATP energy. So let's begin. The hydrogen ions are preserved for the dark stage. We are done with hydrogen. So we only say that. The hydrogen ions are preserved for the dark stage. And then the oxygen molecules, excess oxygen are released into the atmosphere, while some oxygen is preserved by the plant in order to make energy in form of ATP. So remember this. I did not say that oxygen is released into the atmosphere. I only said excess oxygen is released because the plant releases excess oxygen. So excess oxygen will be released into the atmosphere while some oxygen will be preserved by the plant for the formation of ATP energy for the plant. So after that, let's talk about the ATP energy. So the ATP energy is preserved by the plant and then it is used also to make the starch. So this ATP energy is the reserve energy which is used by the plant for any other physiological or metabolic processes of the plant. Basically, it's just the energy that plant uses to carry out all the other activities. And then we are done with the products of photosynthesis. So that is that, with the products of light stage of photosynthesis, because that's what the question was asking about. So remember, if I've been asked a question like this, products, only base your argument on the products, hydrogen atoms, oxygen, gas, and the ATP energy. If you give any other thing, those are irrelevant. So this is what only the question is asking. So question next is asking, define the term cell specialization. So this is the process whereby a cell is modified in order to perform a specific function. That is cell specialization. So it's the modification of a cell in order to perform a specific function. So that was that simple as that. So the next question was asking, stage two specialized animal cells. We have the sperm cells, we have the nerve cells, etc. So we have very many different types. Also, we have the red blood cells, we have the white blood cells, and many others. So cell specialization is the modification of a cell to perform a specific function. And then these are the examples of the modified cells that have been used to perform the specific function. Like for example, what's the function of the sperm cell? The sperm cell is used to fertilize the ovum. That's the function of the sperm cell. What's the function of the nerve cell? The nerve cell is used to transmit impulse from one side of the body to the other side of the body. That's the function of the nerve cell. In fact, the nerve cells, they are used for irritability. What is irritability? This is the ability of an organism to be able to detect and respond to environmental stimuli. So that is that. We have the red blood cell. The function of the red blood cell is to transport oxygen or dissolved gases. The function of the white blood cell, so the white blood cell is used to fight harmful microorganisms in the body or protect the body from infections. 
So that is as simple as that. So we have very many different types of animal cells specialized, and we covered them in the previous class. So the next question is asking, the cell structure below was observed under the light microscope, as you can see. So if you have been given this structure, this is always the structure of the cell membrane. So this is always the structure of the cell membrane. So the question is asking, uh, identify the cell structure. So this cell structure is always the cell, is always the cell membrane. Name the parts labeled A and B. So the part labeled, the part labeled A, that is the phospholipid layer. So the middle part is always the phospholipid layer. Then part labeled B, this is always the protein layer. So remember, in the cell membrane, we always have two regions. We always have the phospholipid layer and we always have the protein layer. So the diagram can be drawn as that or can be drawn as that. So if you have been given such a diagram, you should know that if this is the diagram, these are the phospholipid layers, these are the, uh, the protein layers. If you have this other diagram, these are the protein layers and then these are the, the phospholipid layers and then you're good to go. So the que next question, which is C, is asking state one function of the above structure. So the cell membrane, what's the function of the cell membrane? First of all is semi-permeability. What is semi-permeability? Semi-permeability meaning that it's the ability of the cell of the cell membrane to be able to allow some materials to enter the cell while some materials not to enter the cell. That is semi-permeability. So the, the definition of permeable means that allow something to enter. Semi-permeable means that some materials can enter while some materials cannot enter the cell. So that is the definition of semi-permeability. So the first function of the cell membrane is semi-permeability. The other function of the cell membrane is that it possesses electrical charges which are used to detect the environmental stimuli. So that's the other function of the cell membrane. So it has the positive and the negative charges which are used to detect the changes in the environment. So after detecting the changes, now the cell can be able to act accordingly uh, in relation to what the cell membrane has communicated. So that is also the other function of the cell membrane. So the next question is asking, in an experiment equal amounts of three different sugar solutions were placed in visking tubing, which is X, Y, and the other one is Z. So as you can see, that is the experiment whereby we have the visking tubing, and then the setup was left for two hours, and then the results were shown in the diagrams below. So we have the beginning of the experiment, and then the other one is the end of the experiment. So the question is asking, name the process which is being investigated. So the process here which is being investigated is always osmosis. So why did you say that the process is osmosis? So the process is osmosis because you are being told that three different sugar solutions were placed in visking tubing. So in this experiment we see that we have three visking tubings which have sugar solutions inside them. Then the surrounding of the visking tubing we see that we have some traces of water. So anytime you'll see that we are involving water in an experiment, that always points towards osmosis. Again, anytime you'll see that we have water in an experiment, that experiment is always pointing towards osmosis, unless the question states otherwise. But anytime you see we have water and then we have physiological process, that is always osmosis. So inside the visking tubing, we have sugar solution, then outside we have some water solution. So name the process being investigated. So the process being investigated, we have osmosis process. So by osmosis, this is the movement of water molecules from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration. For the definition of osmosis, you must mention water molecules, you must mention low to high, and also you must mention through a semi-permeable membrane. If you omit any of those three, you're going to get it wrong. So the next one is asking stage two importance of the process named in A above in living organism. So the first one we have osmoregulation. Now by this the regulation of water inside of the living organism. And then apart from that we have absorption of water from the soil into the root hair cell. So we also have that absorption of water from the soil into the root hair cell. And also we have absorption of water in the nephron of the kidney. So in the nephron of the kidney, we also have absorption of water taking place. And also apart from that, we also have absorption of water from the large intestine back into the bloodstream. So we have those 
importance of the process of osmosis. So absorption of water from the soil into the root hair cell, osmoregulation, absorption of water in the nephron of the kidney and absorption of water from the large intestine of the kidney. So the next question is asking, name the carbohydrate that is found in abundance in the mammalian blood. So the carbohydrate found in abundance in the mammalian blood, so we have glucose. So we have glucose in the bloodstream. So the glucose is what is supplied in the mitochondrion. So if the mitochondrion has enough glucose, it will be able to produce energy. So we have glucose. So name the carbohydrate that is stored in the mammalian liver. So that is glycogen. So excess carbohydrate or excess glucose is stored in the liver in form of glycogen molecules. So you might be asked this question. So what is the form of carbohydrate stored in, the, in animals and in plants? So for the animals, we have the glycogen. Uh, yeah, for the animals, we have the glycogen, which is stored in the liver. For the plants, we have the starch, which is stored in the plant. So for the animals, we have glycogen. And for the animals, we have the starch. List two importance of water in living organisms. So this is basically asking, what is the importance of water? Why do you drink water? So the importance of water is that it has acts as a solvent to dissolve all the other chemicals found inside the living organism. It also helps in the formation of blood, or it also helps to make the blood to be fluid. It helps in the formation of milk in, in the mammary glands of different organisms, etc. So we have different functions of water. Also, it helps in the different metabolic processes which are found in the body. So the next question is asking, the enzyme pepsin and trypsin are secreted in inactive precursor. So we have pepsin, which is the inactive form is pepsinogen, trypsin inactive form is trypsinogen. So what are the names of the precursors? <laughs> exactly what you have just answered. So what are the names of the precursor? So for the pepsin, we have the pepsinogen, which is the inactive form of pepsin. For the trypsin, we have the trypsinogen, which is the inactive form of the trypsin. So the next question, why are they secreted in inactive form? So they are secreted in inactive form in order to avoid self-digestion of the glands that have produced them. So remember, the trypsin and the pepsin, so these are used to digest the proteins and for the digestion of milk to uh, milk casein to carcinogen. So it will mean that if they have been secreted in an active form, they are going to digest the glands whereby they have been produced. So remember in biology, gland is anything that secretes another substance. So anything secreting an enzyme, anything secreting a chemical inside the body is called a gland. So they are secreted in an inactive form in order to avoid self-digestion of the glands that have produced them. So that's the answer. Uh, so after the, the inactive form have been secreted, so the hydrochloric acid activates now these substances, the pepsin to the pepsinogen to now pepsin, whereby the pepsin will now digest the food. The trypsinogen to trypsin, whereby it will digest the proteins. So they are secreted in an inactive form in order to avoid self-digestion of the glands that have produced them. So the next question is asking, state two structural and two environmental factors that affect the rate of transpiration. So transpiration, remember the definition and say that this is the process whereby plants lose excess water to the surrounding. Definition of transpiration, avoid saying this. Avoid saying that transpiration is the process whereby plants lose water to the surrounding. That is wrong. If plants lose water, they are going to die. They don't lose water. They only lose excess water. So the excess water is the one which is going to be lost, not water. If you give that definition, the process whereby plants lose water, you're going to get it wrong. The best definition of transpiration say that this is the process whereby plants lose excess water to the surrounding. If you only say they lose water, you'll get it wrong. You must say they lose excess water to the surrounding. So we see we have two main factors affecting transpiration. First of all, we have structural factors and environmental factors or we have structural or internal factors, and then we have environmental or external factors. So those are the two main factors affecting transpiration. For the structural factors, these are the factors found within the plant that may affect transpiration. Uh, the factors include the size of the stomata. If the stomata is large, 
transpiration will be very high. If they are very tiny, transpiration will be very low. We have sunken stomata. If we have sunken stomata, transpiration will be very low. If we have stomata exposed openly in the leaf, transpiration will be very high. We have the size of the leaf whereby a larger leaf, transpiration will be high. A thin leaf, transpiration will be low. ETC. So structural factors, this means the factors found within the plant that affect transpiration. The environmental factors or external factors, these are mainly the factors that are found outside of the plant. So the factors found on the environment that affect the rate of transpiration. We have, first of all, we have the amount of humidity. If the humidity is very high, transpiration will be low. If the humidity is low, transpiration will be very high. We have also air pressure. If the air pressure is very high, transpiration will be low. If the air pressure is very low, transpiration will be very high. Apart from that, we have wind. If we have a lot of wind currents, transpiration will be very, very much, uh, will be very much high. If we have low windy environment, transpiration will be very, very, very low. And also we have precipitation, like for example, moisture, we have rain, because moisture mostly points towards humidity. If we have very high amount of humidity, so transpiration will be, will be very low. If we have very low humidity, transpiration will be very high etc so remember the structural factors these are the internal factors that affect the rate of transpiration and then we have environmental factors so these are the external factors surrounding the plant that affect the rate of transpiration so stage two structural and two environmental factors affecting the rate of transpiration so we have structural is those we have listed the size of the leaf the number of stomata the position of stomata it is the environmental factors. We have things like rainfall, humidity, air pressure, etc. So we have among those. So the next question, the next question is asking, the diagram below is a transverse section of a certain part of a dicotyledonous plant. As you can see, that is the dicotyledonous plant. So first question, which is A, is asking, which part of the plant was this section obtained from? So this part was obtained from a dicotyledonous plant. Why did we say we, it was obtained from a dicotyledonous plant? It's because, look at the xylem. The xylem at the center. So the xylem at the center is star-shaped. So it is only a dicotyledonous root uh, structure which has a star-shaped star xylem. So since we have a star-shaped xylem, it will mean that this automatically is from a dicotyledonous plant, whereby the phloem always surrounds the star shape. So for the, for the monocotyledonous plant, that is what we have. So we have the scattered vascular bundles. So for the, yeah, the scattered vascular bundles, as you can be able to see. So for the dicotyledonous plant, remember, they are centrally placed, and then we have a very large star-shaped, a very large star-shaped xylem, and then the other one is for the monocotyledonous. So the next one is asking, give a reason for your answer in A. So the reason is what we have just said. We have a star-shaped, a star-shaped xylem. Yeah, we have a star-shaped xylem. So the star-shaped xylem always points towards this is a dicotyledonous and not a monocotyledonous. Also, we can say that the phloem, the phloem are surrounding a star-shaped xylem. So that, that is also another reason why you can say that this is from a dicotyledonous, a dicotyledonous root here cell. Yeah. So the next one is, uh, the next question, state the function of the part labeled A and C. So A is a root hair cell. So part A, the root hair cell, the only function of root hair cell is absorption of water and mineral salts from the soil and into the plant. So the part labeled C, the part labeled C, it was, uh, that was the xylem. So the part labeled C xylem, this is for the transportation of water and mineral salts from the roots to the leaves of the plant. That is the only function of the xylem. So part C is pointing towards xylem. So the function of the xylem is transportation of water from the root to the leaves of the plant. So the function of part labeled A, which is the root hair cell, is absorption of water and mineral salts. Part labeled C function, which is the xylem, transportation of water from the roots to the leaves of the plant. So give an example of an animal with open circulatory system. So we have the two different types of circulatory system, whereby we have the closed circulatory system and the open circulatory system. 
So the open circulatory system blood is transported in a place which is called the hymosil or the blood is transported in open body cavity or the blood is transported in the body cavity. For example, if you have ever squashed or squished a cockroach, so you'll see that there are no blood vessels. So it's like a, cro a cockroach is like a balloon. So if you just squish, everything spills out. So that region whereby that blood of the cockroach is found, that region is called the hymosil. So the hymosil is mainly found in the open circulatory system. So the fluid which is found inside the hymosil is called the hymolymph. Therefore, the blood for this organism, mostly the insect, the blood for the insect, don't call them blood. If you call them blood, that is wrong. A blood is a fluid which has the blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, etc. So the blood, let's just say the blood, the blood of the insect is called the hymolymph. So don't say the blood of the insect, but say the hymolymph of the insect. So the hymolymph is found inside the hymosil. So this question is asking, so before you go to the question, so that is the open circulatory system whereby the blood is found in the hymosil and then th that blood is referred to as the hymolymph. While in the closed circulatory system, we have blood vessels, whereby in the blood vessels, we have now the blood which is being transported in closed blood vessels. So in the closed circulatory system, we have the blood vessels, arteries, veins, and capillaries, which are used to transport the blood from one region of the body to the other. For the open circulatory system, the blood is, the hymolymph is found suspended inside the organism. So it is just found suspended inside the organism. So this question is asking, give an example of, of an animal with open circulatory system. Those are just give any insect. We have the cockroach, we have the housefly, we have the bee, we have the wasp, etc. Mostly insect have the open circulatory system. The closed circulatory system, we have the mammals, we have the reptiles, we have the birds, we have the amphibians, etc. So those have the closed circulatory system whereby we have the heart and the blood vessels. So that's the difference between open, the blood is found in the hymosil, whereby the blood is called the hymolymph. While in closed circulatory system, we have a muscular heart which pumps blood through closed vessels which are called the blood vessels. So that's the difference between those two. So the next question is about the heart. And it's asking, the diagram below shows an internal structure of the mammalian heart. Name the part labeled B. So if you can see the part labeled B, those are the valves which we talked about. So those valves found in the right and the left part, those valves on the upper part, they are always called the semilunar valve. For you to be able to identify the two valves found below, so you just give the acronym TB, and that is tricuspid valve on the right side and bicuspid valve on the left hand side. So they form the acronym TB, tricuspid, bicuspid. Why is it called tricuspid? It has three openings or three flaps which allow the passage of blood. Why is that other one on the left side called bicuspid? It's called bicuspid because it has two flaps which allow the passage of blood from the left auricle to the left ventricle. So that is about those valves. So the two valves found on the top, they are called the semilunar valves. So the next question is asking, the muscular wall of chamber D is at least three times thicker than chamber E. So for the chamber D, we see that this chamber is the left ventricle, and then chamber E, this is the right ventricle. So we have been told that the walls of the left ventricle are muscular than the right ventricle. Give a reason for this. So the reason why we, uh, the left ventricle is muscular, the first reason we gave is that it pumps blood at very high pressure. The second reason we gave is that it pumps blood over a very long distance. The right ventricle only pumps blood from the heart to the lungs and back to the heart. The left ventricle pumps blood from the heart to the rest of the body. Uh, from the heart to the rest of the body and back to the heart. So the blood is passing at very long distance. And those are the two reasons why the left ventricle, which is letter D, is thicker than the right ventricle, which is letter E. The next question, name a special characteristic of the heart muscle which distinguish it from the other muscle because the heart is just a muscle. The heart as it is, it is just a very large muscle placed in one place. So why is it that the, that the heart, the muscles of the heart, they are different from the, all other muscles of the body? So th these muscles are different because we'll say that they are myogenic. 
Why did you say that they are myogenic? What does it mean myogenic? It means that these muscles functions, they function without fatigue. They function continuously. Because from when you are born, that heart muscle has been functioning from the day that you are born up to today. It is still functioning continuously. It has never stopped functioning. It functions continuously. So due to this, this is what is called myogenic. They pump without fatigue or they pump or they work without getting tired. They work continuously. And that's why we'll say that the heart muscle is unique apart from all the other muscles of the body. So they are myogenic, they function without fatigue. And that's the answer to that. So the next question is asking, in what way does the artery labeled G differ from the arteries of the body? So that artery labeled G, we called it pulmonary artery. So this question is asking, why is it that artery G is different from all the other arteries of the body? The answer we gave, we say that it is different because it is the only artery which carries deoxygenated blood. Why is it carrying deoxygenated blood? It is carrying deoxygenated blood because it is receiving the blood from the right ventricle is at very high pressure. Since this blood is at very high pressure, this blood must go through an artery. Because if a vein was to be placed there, this high pressure of the blood would rupture the vein. Therefore, this high pressure from the right ventricle must pass through an artery, which is not the pulmonary artery, and to the lungs. So this other side, the left side, we have the pulmonary vein. This is the only vein which carries oxygenated blood. All the other veins carry deoxygenated in the body. But pulmonary vein is the only vein which carries oxygenated blood. Why is this the reason? So it is the only vein which carries deoxygenated, deoxygenated blood because blood from the lungs is at very low pressure. Since this blood is at very low pressure, there is the risk of backflow of blood. So what happens is that these veins have, they have the valves. And these valves prevent the backflow of the blood. And therefore, an artery could never be placed in place of the pulmonary vein because arteries, they don't, they don't have valves. So if an artery was to be placed there, there could be some risk of this blood going back to the lung, which might be fatal. So the pulmonary vein is now placed on that side in order to prevent the backflow of blood and because the blood from that side, left side, is at low pressure. And by this, this is the only vein which carries oxygenated blood. So this question, in what ways does the artery label G differ from the other arteries of the body? You'll say that this is the only artery which carries deoxygenated blood. That is the pulmonary artery. So remember, the circulation in the arteries, you say that this constitutes the pulmonary circulation because blood from the heart enters the pulmonary artery to the lungs and then pulmonary vein back to the heart. So that is pulmonary circulation. The other circulation we looked at was systemic circulation whereby blood from the heart leaves the heart through the outer to the rest of the body and then back to the heart through the vena cava. So that constitutes the systemic circulation. So the second last question is asking, the figure below is a diagram of a potometer. So anytime you hear a potometer, so a potometer is an apparatus used to to check or to measure the rate of transpiration of a given area. So potometer is used for to measure the rate of transpiration. So the question is asking, what is the apparatus used for? So the apparatus is basically used for measuring the rate of transpiration of a given area. So define the term you have named in A above. Define the term transpiration. Transpiration is say that this is the process whereby mm, plants lose excess water to the surrounding. You must say excess. So this is the process whereby plants lose excess water to the surrounding. So the last question is about dentition. It's about the, uh, the structure of the tooth whereby the question is asking. The figure below is a diagram of a vertical section of a mammalian tooth. Name the part labeled A and B. So the part labeled A. Don't label this part as the crown. If you give this part as the crown, you are not going to get it correct. Because you could only say it's a crown if this is the external. You have only been given the external structure. So if you have been given the external structure, you must always mention that it's not the crown. Rather, if this is the external, if it could have been the external structure of the tooth, therefore name it as crown. But now this is the internal. You can be able to see inside the tooth what is there. We have the dentine enamel, the 
nerve cells. So if it is the, ex the internal structure, don't say it's the crown, but say this is the enamel. So the enamel is what you should give if it's the, extern the internal structure of the tooth. But if the diagram could have been external structure of the tooth, that's why you could have said that this region is the crown. So always take note not to confuse between, uh, between the crown and the enamel. So remember crown if you have been given external structure. You'll say enamel if you have been given the internal structure. Like this case, we have the internal structure. So name the part labeled B. So the part labeled B, so this is the, this is the gum. This is the gum. So part labeled B, that is the gum. So the next question, list down any ways of preventing teeth diseases. So any way of preventing teeth diseases, so there is appropriate brushing, avoid taking sugary foods. So the other one is uh, use teeth for the correct purpose. Um, use herbal toothpaste if available, so use herbal toothpaste, etc. and etc. So those are among the questions that were asked in this, in this paper.